Massive layoffs and pay cuts hit China's banking industry. China's big six banks' average annual salary exceeds 300,000 yuan, criticized as a joke. Shongxi Group sounds alarm, ordinary workers face inescapable hardship. Gold exchanges close across China, Shenzhen mandates real name registration for gold trading. Xi Jinping's mentor emerges, past high-profile moves leave netizens laugh out loud. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Massive layoffs and pay cuts hit China's banking industry. Recent reports from mainland Chinese media have revealed that layoffs and salary cuts have become a harsh reality for banks in China as they attempt to cut costs and tighten their belts. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, has seen the most significant number of layoffs. Since 2016, ICBC has been steadily reducing its workforce and number of branches. The bank's employee count has decreased from a peak of over 460,000 to less than 420,000 in 2023, resulting in a loss of 42,500 jobs over a seven-year period, which averages out to about 6,000 layoffs per year. Similarly, the number of ICBC branches has decreased from 17,200 in 2016 to 16,300 in 2023, a reduction of more than 900 locations. Industrial Bank had the highest percentage of layoffs, with a nearly 5% decrease in its workforce last year, amounting to 3,271 fewer employees. ABC and Pingin Bank also contributed to the job losses, each laying off more than 1,000 people. For bank employees, the situation is grim. Not only are salary increases unlikely, but there is also a risk that the performance-based wages they have already received may be clawed back by their employers. As listed banks release their annual reports, many have disclosed information about the clawback of performance-based compensation. For example, China Merchants Bank reported that 4,415 employees were subject to these clawbacks during the reporting period, amounting to a total of 43.29 million yuan, approximately $6.3 million. Similarly, Bank of China executed clawbacks on 2,059 person times, recovering a total of 22.75 million yuan, approximately $3.3 million. China's big six banks' average annual salary exceeds 300,000 yuan, criticized as a joke. On March 28, 2023, Zhongxin Jingwei revealed that average salaries at China's six major banks exceeded 300,000 yuan, about 41,466 US dollars, with all but one bank reporting higher wages than the year prior. This became a trending topic online. In detail, the Bank of Communications led with average salaries reaching 435,500 yuan, about 60,195 US dollars, followed by the Bank of China and China Construction Bank, CCB, with CCB actually seeing a 4.64% decrease in average salary. Despite these figures, a Guangdong CCB employee's relative alleged to Radio Free Asia that the bank had cut employee salaries by nearly 20% and reduced benefits, a claim not officially confirmed and suggesting that the actual salaries are far lower than reported. This has sparked online discussions, with some Weibo users questioning if the average salaries truly reflect what all employees earn. One user pointed out the folly of average salaries, mockingly noting that averaging salaries can be misleading, comparing it to averaging their own salary with that of a wealthy individual like Jack Ma, which would inaccurately inflate their perceived income. In response to the debate, a Sound of Hope reporter interviewed Xiao Duo, a US-based commentator on Chinese issues, on April 2. According to Xiao Duo, the concept of an average salary in banks is misleading because it's skewed by the very high salaries of top executives such as bank presidents, who might earn as much as a thousand regular employees combined. This discrepancy creates a false impression that all salaries are rising when, in fact, most employees are seeing their earnings decrease while top leaders see substantial gains. Xiao highlighted the flawed approach to calculating these average salaries in Chinese institutions, particularly those connected to the government. There's a widespread practice among higher-ups to profit at the expense of the general workforce. 
For example, a bank manager who oversees successful transactions might take a cut of up to 30% from the profits generated by their team, disproportionately benefiting the ones at the top. As a result, reported average salaries are not accurate reflections of what most employees earn. Regarding corruption at high levels, Xiao Duo revealed that a central bank president illicitly pocketed billions of yuan meant for circulation in the economy. By manipulating the amount of money reported for lending and other transactions, he was able to siphon off public funds for personal gain. This action is indicative of a broader system where senior bank figures command a share of the profits from lower-level earnings, a demand that can increase over time. Zhongxi Group Sounds Alarm Ordinary Workers Face Inescapable Hardship The bankruptcy of Zhongxi Enterprise Group, China's largest asset management company, is a clear indication of the worsening financial crisis in the country. The Chinese Communist Party's recent handling of the situation has been exposed, and analysts believe that this serves as a warning to all Chinese citizens. In January, Zhongxi Enterprise Group announced that it had $64 billion in debt and was unable to meet its financial obligations, leading to a filing for bankruptcy and liquidation. By March, the Chinese Communist Party's police force had taken criminal compulsory measures against the company's executives and were in the process of recovering stolen money. Subsequently, reports emerged online that the authorities had begun to aggressively reclaim wages from employees across the Zhongxi system. This includes current and former employees of the four major companies under Zhongxi, Hengtian Wealth, Datang Wealth, Xinhu Wealth, and Daoxing Wealth, who were involved in the fixed income product chain, encompassing not only sales staff but also back office personnel in human resources, finance, and operations. The authorities are seeking to recover wages from the past five years, with only janitors and doormen being exempt. The impact of this decision has been devastating for many employees. Some have reported crying in the bathroom upon receiving the recovery notice, realizing that they may have to sell their homes and cars to return the money they earned through hard work, which has now been deemed illegal. They face a difficult choice, return the money or face legal consequences. One Weibo user highlighted the injustice of the situation, noting that tens of thousands of investors have suffered substantial losses due to the Xiongxi system's collapse, yet the burden of fund recovery has fallen on the shoulders of grassroots financial advisors. Many of these advisors had already returned most of their commissions to customers to meet performance targets and had kept little for themselves. The user argues that the executives are responsible for the company's misconduct, while the financial advisors are merely salespeople working for a state-recognized institution. With tens of thousands of advisors in the Zhongxi system, the user questions the feasibility of arresting everyone who refuses to return the money. The wage recovery process may have the most severe impact on junior employees in back-office support roles, who are likely to be the hardest hit. A prime example is a friend of a commenter who worked in a support position at one of the four major Zhongxi companies. Despite earning a modest salary and never having sold fixed income products, they trusted the company and invested 100,000 yuan, about 13,822 US dollars, in its equity incentives. Following the company's bankruptcy, they were laid off without compensation and have struggled to find new employment for the past six months. Living in a major city with significant family expenses, including children and a mortgage, has left them in a state of constant worry. Currently, they are dependent on consumer loans to survive, and the possibility of further wage recovery has left them questioning how they will be able to support their family moving forward. There's growing concern online about the risks associated with working in the finance sector, as there have been instances where former employees, even those who left years ago, are being contacted to repay wages. This started with banks and securities companies and has spread to wealth management firms. Now, people are worried that any industry could be next. The implication is that nobody is safe, this isn't just a single company's problem but could affect anyone in the workforce. There's fear about the possibility of retrospective financial audits that could force current and former employees to return wages they've already spent. The CCP has a long-standing practice of bolstering its hold on power by exploiting the public. 
With the economic crisis worsening, Beijing has been broadening its scope of financial audits, starting with a crackdown on political adversaries within the government, then moving on to the wealthy elite, and now, it's the average person's turn. Online discussions are heating up with people questioning the actual ownership of their hard-earned cash. The consensus? It's overly optimistic to think so. The everyday individual, often referred to as leaks, a symbol for those easily harvested by the system, puts in the effort day in and day out, only to see their earnings swallowed up by home and car payments, leaving hardly a dime to spare. Gold exchanges close across China, Shenzhen mandates real name registration for gold trading. As previously reported, prominent gold and jewelry companies, including the state-owned China Gold and Shandong Gold, have shut several stores in Beijing, leaving investors unable to reclaim their stored gold, leading to expected losses of over 400 million yuan, about 55.3 million US dollars. China is also set to close financial exchanges in five regions. Shenzhen now mandates real name registration for gold purchases exceeding 20,000 yuan, about 2,764 US dollars, and this policy has been verified as true. In response to why China is enforcing real name registration for gold transactions, Sound of Hope interviewed veteran political and economic analyst Wu Jialong on April 2. Mr. Wu said that China's new registration policy for gold buyers addresses two major problems, the use of gold transactions for online scams and money laundering, and the risk of corrupt officials hiding illicit funds by purchasing gold through third-party accounts. The real name policy ensures that the identity of the purchaser matches the payment details, reducing the risk of such fraudulent activities. He also explained the reasons behind the closure of gold stores, noting that speculative practices led to trouble when gold prices unexpectedly continued to rise past $2,000, causing a short squeeze. Some store operators who had bet on falling prices by selling borrowed gold had to flee when unable to buy it back at lower prices, leading to criminal proceedings. He also highlighted that gold remains a secure reserve asset. China's closure of consumer gold markets, not official exchanges, supports the yuan's internationalization by increasing gold reserves, offsetting the reduction in U.S. dollar reserves. Wu assures that the risk of theft or depletion of central bank gold reserves is minimal due to these strategic financial policies. Xi Jinping's mentor emerges, past high-profile moves leave netizens laugh out loud. Qing Yongyan, a prominent Chinese scholar and one of Xi Jinping's nine economic mentors, recently attended the BOA Forum for Asia, where he shared his insights on U.S.-China relations and the South China Sea dispute. His remarks that the Chinese people neither understand nor comprehend the United States seem to be a public slap in the face to many of China's aggressive nationalists and staunch government supporters. During the South China Sea subforum, Xing outlined four main attitudes held by the Chinese people towards the United States. These range from looking down on the U.S., believing that China has nothing to fear, to being extremely fearful of the consequences of U.S. actions, particularly in the South China Sea. Some Chinese are excessively pro-American, believing that the U.S. can do no wrong, while others harbor intense hatred towards the U.S., with some even making it their job to do so. Qing argues that while there has been a push for the U.S. to better understand China, it is the Chinese who should put more effort into understanding the United States. He believes that despite China's significant investment in researching the U.S., the Chinese people still lack a comprehensive understanding of the country. Regarding the U.S.-China rivalry in the South China Sea, Qing considers it to be an asymmetrical contest that should involve two rational actors. He warns that when an emotionally driven China engages with a relatively rational U.S., China risks falling into the trap of confrontational thinking and potentially ending up in a situation similar to the U.S.-Soviet Cold War. Qing Yongnian, 62, is originally from Yuyao County, Zhejiang Province, and graduated from Peking University. After the events of 1989, he pursued his doctoral studies in political science at Princeton University. Despite facing allegations of sexual harassment and resigning from his positions at the National University of Singapore and the East Asian Institute, Xing remains in favor with the Chinese Communist Party.
Upon his return to China, he was appointed to several prestigious positions, including the role of dean at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Global and Contemporary China at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. Qing participated in a symposium chaired by Xi in August 2020. Tsinghua University should be renamed to Xi Jinping University. Rumors have circulated online that Qing initiated a petition on the website change.org to rename Tsinghua University, one of China's most prestigious universities and Xi Jinping's alma mater, to Xi Jinping University. The petition, allegedly addressed to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, the Ministry of Education, and Tsinghua University itself, emphasized the importance of holding high the banner of Xi Jinping thought and leading China into a new era. The petition argued that renaming would create a symbolic balance, with Sun Yat-sen University in the south and Xi Jinping University in the north, representing the historical ideologies of Sun Yat-sen's three principles of the people and the Communist Party's Xi Jinping thought. It also stressed the need to use Xi Jinping thought to cultivate China's most outstanding young talents and train elites across various fields. While the authenticity of the petition remains uncertain, it has been met with ridicule and skepticism from netizens. Some have sarcastically suggested renaming other universities, such as Peking University, to Xi Jinping No. 1 Middle School and Xi Jinping No. 2 Middle School. Others have proposed changing the word university to elementary school, arguing that it would be more fitting given the situation. In a related incident, an article appeared online in November of the same year, titled The Constitution Confirms Chairman Xi Jinping as the Father of the People's Republic of China. The article, which served as a declaration for the establishment of the Chinese Nation Revival Association and Xi Jinping Thought Research Association, compared Xi Jinping to historical figures like Sun Yat-sen and George Washington, suggesting that he should be honored as the father of the People's Republic of China and the father of the nation for his role in realizing national rejuvenation. However, the article also emphasized Xi's adherence to the socialist road with Chinese characteristics under the Marxist-Leninist ideology of the Communist Party. Xi Yongnian's name was prominently featured on the list of petitioners and founding members of the Chinese Nation Revival Association. Article criticizing CCP's economic flaws censored. In 2022, amidst China's economic downturn due to the zero-COVID policy, Xing Yongnian wrote an article titled 10 Suggestions for Reviving China's Economy. The article discussed policy mistakes and internal factors contributing to the CC's economic governance issues. Despite Zheng's status and his mild criticism, the article was censored in mainland China, demonstrating that even the in-house think tank is not immune to repercussions for expressing dissenting views. Zhang's article highlighted three main problems with China's economy, abnormal capital outflow, private entrepreneurs struggling due to the pandemic, and unprecedented employment pressure. He attributed these issues to both external factors, such as the U.S. technological blockade and the rise of neighboring countries like India and Vietnam, and internal reasons, including the impact of industry rectifications on the private sector, uncertainty in economic policies, and excessive regulation. Zhang's suggestions for addressing these issues included adopting a non-ideological approach to state-owned and private enterprises, adjusting their structure, promoting institutional opening up, avoiding politically driven policy adjustments, and establishing professional and neutral economic policy institutions. Despite publicly questioning some of the Chinese Communist Party's policies, Zhang's ultimate goal, as Xi Jinping's chief economic advisor, appears to be protecting the party from economic collapse and regime change. However, Xi Jinping has shown little interest in relinquishing state control or initiating substantial structural reforms. Instead, he has consistently tightened his grip on businesses and the economy as a whole. Given that Jing Yongnian's article contradicts the supreme leader's will, it inevitably faced the fate of being censored and removed from circulation. Let us know your thoughts on today's topic by leaving a comment below. If you found this video helpful, please share it with a friend, it inspires us to continue creating more quality and reliable content. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting insights from China Truths. Thanks for tuning in.